Welcome back Year 5. Chance now to read chapter 19 of our class text, Rooftoppers by Catherine Rundle. Sophie slept most of the next day and woke in her own bed to find it was raining. It rose to a storm in the night. Sophie counted the seconds between the lightning and thunder. One, two, and then boom. She did, she did not dare go out on the rooftop. The next day was no better. Charles trudged out in an inadequate borrowed raincoat to look for lawyers. I'll keep lookout if you'll let me use your window, Sophie told him. Come back soon, all right? And don't get spotted. She rubbed his sleeve, which was too short by an inch. I won't, and you, Sophie, make sure you don't leave this room, said Charles, unless you absolutely have to. If you need to pee, use the chamber pot. I don't want the other guests to see you. So all day, Sophie sat by Charles's window with a cup of cocoa in her lap and kept lookout. She was watching for policemen and for cello players. Almost nobody went by and those who did were hidden by umbrellas. She strained her ears for cello music until her head roared and she heard requiems behind every horse and cart. Every few minutes she crossed and uncrossed her fingers. The cup of cocoa grew a skin and then grew cold. Sophie didn't notice, the rain didn't stop. When Sophie went to bed, the rain was torrential. She woke again, though, to hear the clock striking two and the downpour slowed to a drizzle. The clouds were blowing across the moon and the moonlight flashed on and off inside her room like Morse code. Sophie shoved back, to, back her covers and jumped up. She felt as awake as day. She pulled on her stockings and over them her trousers and two jerseys. Then she cut the tips off the stockings and rolled them back to expose her toes. She clambered out of her window, leaving it open, dripping into, onto the bed. Matteo was sitting cross-legged by his fire, leaning against the largest chimney stack. He had a knife in one hand and something pinkish in the other. It looked suspiciously like a skinned rat. Sophie whistled and he dropped whatever it was into the embers and ran to fetch her across the tightrope. When they reached the fire, the animal was smoking. Matteo swore, Ah, rat is never delicious, but burnt rat is disgusting. What's rat like? Matteo sat and pulled her down beside him. Sit. I didn't think you'd come in the rain. It's like hedgehog. I've never had hedgehog either. Have you eaten rabbit? He threw a, threw a sack over her knees and pulled one over his shoulders. Yes, I've had rabbit. The sack was wet, but Sophie didn't say so. His sack, she could see, was wetter. Well, it's not like rabbit, but it's not not like rabbit. Here, you can try it. Sophie took it, sniffed it. It did not sm smell inspiring. Matteo said, leave some for me though, more than half, I'm bigger. Is this breakfast, she asked him, or dinner? This is lunch. I had breakfast when I woke up, sort of. When was that? Sophie nibbled at the rat's thigh. The rat tasted of charcoal and horse tails. She swallowed with an effort. It's not bad, she said. Here though, it's yours. I don't know, sunset, so about nine o'clock. Matteo tore at the rat with his teeth. I have supper at five o'clock in the morning, if there is any supper. Why wouldn't there be? He shrugged. It's been a bad week for food. His face up close was tight pulled and thin, and he said, I'm tired, perhaps you'd better not stay long. I'm so sorry, Curfie Sophie cursed inwardly. I should have thought to bring food. She had forgotten that he might be hungry. I didn't realise, but Matteo, please let me stay. I need to be up here to listen. Her skin was burning. It always did when she thought of her mother. Please. Fine, Matteo flopped onto his back and stared up at the stars. I'm too hungry to talk, though. Why is it worse than usual? Why? He sat, half sat, and stared at her incredulously. The rain, the rain, obviously. Sophie lay down a little way apart. In the moonlight, Matteo's face was the colour of old snow. Does the rain make hunting harder, she said. Yes, the birds go and shelter in the station and rain makes people keep their windows shut at night. There's nothing you can pick up from window sills. What have you had to eat? Seagull, on Tuesday, it got blown in by the storm. It was almost dead anyway. A blue tip for breakfast? I was sorry about that. I quite like them. Alive, I mean. I don't particularly like them to eat and there's not enough meat on them to make it worth plucking them. Sophie couldn't help feeling awed. Was that all? In three days? Oui. Uh, no, I had a candy cane on Sunday. Anastasia and Safi left it for me in the oak tree by the opera. I think it was meant for me. If not, it's not my problem. Sophie turned onto her stomach. 
Who are they? Anastasia and... What was the second name? His face flicked to blank. Nobody. Do you have any food in your pockets, maybe? I don't think so. Sophie fished in her trousers. No, wait, I have raisins. I was carrying them for the birds, actually, but you'd better have them. Yes, said Matteo, I had better. I'm hungry. Anyway, I'd just eat the birds once they'd eaten the raisins, so it's just a skipping a step. What else? Sophie scrabbled deeper. Pockets, she thought, were why trousers were so superior to skirts. Yes! She pulled out a sticky hand. Here, there's some chocolate. It might be quite old, though, and it melted and got mixed up with my trousers, but I think it should be all right. Good, give it to me. Matteo did not, as she'd expected, cram it all into his mouth. Instead, he took a pan from the fire and dropped the chocolate into it. He stirred with, stirred with a whittled stick. Chocolate is best cooked. It makes you feel like there's more of it, he said. He tipped the raisins into the chocolate. There, that smells good. The scent of melted chocolate was spreading over the rooftop. Matteo's body unwound a few inches. For the first time that evening, he smiled. See if you can bring more food next time you come, he said. It's easier up here when you're full. Charles had not had luck with the lawyers. It's not easy, he said. None of them will take a case against the commissioner of police. Most lawyers seem to have the decency and courage of lavatory paper. But we'll find someone, my love. They were at breakfast. Charles is spread Charles spread half a jar's worth of jam on his croissant and dipped it into his coffee. Heaven, he said. You're not eating? I thought I might save it for later. Sophie transferred the croissant to her lap, then to her pocket. You're not hungry? No, thank you. I'm stuffed. Charles paused. Really? His eyebrow hooked itself upwards. You've already hidden your bread roll in your pocket, and if I'm not mistaken, there's an apple in your sock. What are you stuffed with? Inevitably, Sophie's thoughts collapsed in a heap. With biscuits, she said. For breakfast? Unusual. I thought I'd like to see what it was like to have biscuits for breakfast. And what was it like? It was good. I had loads of them. I feel a bit sick now, actually, she half rose. May I go? Not just yet. Sit down, Sophie. Tell me, what sort of biscuits did you have? The chocolate fudge ones. The ones with the soft middle? Yes, he smiled. And you didn't save me any. I'm sorry, they were too delicious. They certainly sound delicious. And these delicious soft fudge chocolate biscuits, they came from where? From the baker, of course. Sophie nodded out of the window to the baker's bright orange awning. Too late, she saw it was rolled in and the lights were out in the windows. How resourceful of you, Charles's eyebrows were bristling with irony. The baker doesn't open on Sundays, Sophie. I know that. I bought them yesterday. Nor does it open on Saturday. Damn, thought Sophie. Her armpits were prickling and her face was growing sweaty. She hated lying. She wasn't sure if she was good at it. She suspected she was not. Oh, yes, I know. I just forgot. I meant Friday. And you paid for them with... What? As far as I know, you have no French money. There was nothing to say, so Sophie said nothing. Is there something you'd like to tell me? Yes, thought Sophie. There were hundreds of things she wanted to tell him, but adults, she thought, were unpredictable, even the best ones. You never knew when they were going to stop you from doing what you were doing. She tucked her fingers into her sash and crossed them tightly. No, she says, nothing at all. And then, after a pause, can I go? Of course. Charles hitched his eyebrows into upside-down Vs. You're a very poor liar, Sophie. I do not recommend a career as an actress. But as long as you aren't doing anything too extravagantly illegal, I am happy for you to have secrets. It's nothing illegal, or if it was, she thought, then it shouldn't be. Keep your secret then, my darling. Everybody needs them. Secrets make you tough and wily. He waited another moment, but Sophie kept her gaze fixed on the rungs of his chair, and he waved her away. Off you go, he said. Go and practice telling lies in front of a mirror. In a few minutes, though, he knocked on her door. The secret, Sophie, he said. Is it a food-based secret? Um, yes, sort of. Is it to do with your mother? Yes, I think so. I hope so, she thought. She crossed every finger and toe. Is another adult involved? No, said Sophie. No, not an adult. Charles seemed about to say something else. Then he shook his head. Good, he said. Keep your secret. Thank you, said Sophie. But Sophie... Charles had turned and she couldn't see his face. Yes? 
Don't dare get hurt or I'll skin you alive. That night, when Sophie went up to her room, her teeth brushed and a French dictionary under her arm, there was a pack on her bed. The note pinned to it was in Charles's handwriting. It said, Everybody needs secrets, only be sure they are good ones. On the back there was a P.S. I have never in my life had enough sausages in one sitting. Sophie hefted the pack. It was heavy and squelchy in places and something at the bottom clinked. She went to open it and then stopped. It would be better if she and Matteo opened it together. It took a great deal of willpower not to open it until she had reached the tightrope. There was no moon and Matteo sat with his legs dangling over the edge of the roof, whistling. Look what I've got, he called. He ran across the tightrope, jumped onto the rooftop and took her hand. Come and see, tomatoes, I've never had so many. The pile of tomatoes reached almost to Sophie's knee. They glistened with the dew that had fallen at sunset. She said, they're wonderful. She meant it, they were just ripe and of, of the large flattish variety, the sort with a swinging kick to the taste. Sophie took one and sniffed it. Where did you get them? She asked. I grew, and don't say you grew them because I won't believe you. You need a greenhouse to grow this sort. Fine, Matteo sneered, a little defiant. I got them from a windowsill, an apartment block in the 8th arrondissement, 5th floor. So you stole them? No, I took them. What's the difference? If something's in the open air, that's fair game, that's hunting. The thought of what Miss Elliot would say to that made Sophie snort, messily. She grinned. What are you going to do with a hundred tomatoes? She said. There's 34, he said haughtily. I counted. His attention shifted from the tomatoes. What's in the pack? I don't know. I thought we should open it together. Why? Now that he asked, Sophie found she couldn't explain. She felt herself turning pink and swore inwardly. You know, like Christmas. I don't understand. What about Christmas? You know, like when you unwrap presents together at Christmas. I don't, said Matteo. His face was on edge. Perhaps he suspected her of making fun of him. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. I think it's food, said Sophie. It's from Charles. Food has a power over bad temper that nothing else has. Matteo's mouth elongated into a smile. It reached his ears. What kind of food? He took the pack and squashed it in his hands. Meat? He held it high over his head. Maybe I'll keep it for myself. Give that back. There was no real point in grabbing for it, but she tried anyway. He was taller than her by a head. We'll open it together, he said magnanimously. He jerked it away as she came nearer. I'll start. The pack was full of parcels wrapped in greaseproof paper. Matteo dipped his face in and sniffed, then lifted out the first parcel. It was bread rolls, four of them, soft in the middle and dusted with flour at the top. They were still warm from the oven and they smelt of blue skies. The bread had been spread by someone with strong opinions about butter. It was as thick as the first joint of Sophie's thumb. I always used to think, says Sophie, that if love had a smell, it would smell like hot bread. What? Matteo was eating already. What are you talking about? A chunk of butter was hanging from his upper lip. Never mind, says Sophie. Since Matteo looked busy, Sophie unpeeled the next package. It felt sticky in her hand. Meat, said Matteo. He hadn't looked up from his two handfuls of bread roll, but he sounded gleefully certain. How do you know? The smell. Matteo was right. The package unfolded away from a hunk of brown meat cut in thick slabs. It didn't look familiar. She held it out to him. What kind of meat is it? Can you tell? Matteo took the largest piece and nibbled a corner. No, I've never had it. It's good though, and it's not pigeon or rat. That I do know. Sophie tried some. It tasted of smoke and salt. It was wonderful up here in the night air. It's venison, I think. I've never had it, but this is how I imagine it. Matteo's head was inside the pack. His hand came out. His fingers were wrapped around two glass bottles. And these? What's in these? Wine, maybe? The bottles were chilled and perspiring in the warm air. Sophie held one against her cheek. They look like wine anyway. But Charles knows I don't like wine, except champagne with blackberries. Matteo shrugged. I've never had that. He sniffed one. Bubbles flew up his nose and he sneezed cat-like. Sophie laughed. Lemonade, I think. At the bottom there was, a half, there was half a chocolate cake, still wet and sticky in the middle, and a jam jar filled with cream, and a fat parcel wrapped in greaseproof paper and, and newspaper. Sausages, cried Matteo. They were as thick as Sophie's wrist. Sophie counted them. Twenty-two, she said. Eleven each. Mon Dieu, said Matteo. 
He added something else in French. Sophie didn't know the word, but it sounded unrepeatable. Whoever your guardian is, I love him. I know, I do too. Sophie grinned into the fire. How many other people, she thought, will give you more sausages than you have fingers and toes? I think we should cook them all at once, she said. I think he meant us to. Non, said Matteo. We should save some for later. But you don't have any ice, do you? If you don't cook them, they'll spoil. I'm starving. Go on, Matteo. A suppressed smile was twitching Matteo's left cheek. Sophie took back for a yes. And I could make tomato soup, she said. Do you know how to make tomato soup, said Matteo? Yes, lied Sophie. At least I'm sure I could work it out. The sausages had no fat or gristle in them. Sophie prodded them. How do we cook them? Do you have a pan? No, said Matteo, but I collect weather vanes. Sophie wondered if his English had gone awry. You collect weather vanes? Yes, I've got almost a dozen. Matteo reached into a sack behind him. He pulled out a handful of long metal spikes and dropped them at Sophie's feet. One of Most of them were fashioned to look like arrows. One, though, was the mast of a ship and one a chicken. The weather vanes were polished and shone bronze and silver in the moonlight. Here, Matteo took three sausages and spiked them onto the longest of the arrows. You do some. Where do you get them? Sophie asked. From rooftops, of course. Isn't that stealing? She skewered four sausages on a silver arrow and laid them on the fire. No, it's not. They don't use them. They let them rust. I use them. They do use them, though. They use them to... To what? Sophie was stymied. Well, to tell which way the wind is blowing, surely. If they are so stupid that they need a weather vane to tell them that, then they do not deserve weather vanes. But then nobody would have weather vanes and there'd be none for you to steal. Find, not steal. He spat on another metal spike and rubbed it on it with his shirt. Anyway, you want to know about the wind? Watch the trees, lick your finger and feel the wind. Pull out a hair and hold it over your head. The sausages were starting to ooze clear juice. Within minutes, the smell was quite fantastic. Sophie rinsed Matteo's largest pot with rainwater. The pot was shaped like a small cauldron made of brass and it made an excellent booming sound when she tapped it with the jam jar. Do you have something to peel them, she asked. No, but you don't peel tomatoes. You're thinking of oranges. I think you do if it's soup, she said doubtfully. Never mind, it should be all right, shouldn't it? She tipped in all the tomatoes bar two. She tossed one to Matteo and they ate them raw. I think we leave it to boil, she said. As an afterf afterthought, she tipped in half a cup of rainwater. Over the next half hour, the tomatoes boiled down into a pulp. Their skins floated to the surface and they fished them out. Sophie with a twig, Matteo with his fingers, and shared them with the dozen pigeons that had gathered round at the sight of crumbs. Can you pass the cream, said Sophie. Don't use it all. Matteo took a quick sip from the jar before he handed it to her. I won't. She tipped in most of the jar, but left enough to drink with the chocolate cake. What else would you put in soup, she thought. She said, do you have salt? Of course I have salt. I'm a roof topper, Sophie, not a savage. Matteo kept his salt in a scrubbed out flower pot, twisted up in a blue square of cloth. There was pepper, too, in a red square. Sophie recognised the cloth of his shorts from the first time they met. I don't much like pepper, says Sophie. I'll just put in the salt if that's all right. You can put pepper in yours. Yes, you do like pepper. You just eat bad pepper in England, said Matteo. I know. I've had some of the food the English leave behind. And add just a little. He took the pepper from her and cracked it between two scraps of slate and tipped it in. Trust me. Sophie added the salt to the soup. The smell was so rich it made her nose shiver. It's ready, I think, she said. They sat side by side with their backs to the wind and drank the soup out of tin cans. The taste made her giddy. It made her want to laugh. Matteo ate whole sausages in a single mouthful. Sophie took four and made them into sandwiches with the venison. She added a slop of soup as a relish and they ate them with both hands. Sophie's hair blew in her mouth and she tied it back with one of Matteo's bowstrings. She couldn't remember having been so happy before. They had made their way through 14 of the sausages and even Matteo was slowing when Sophie froze. Can you hear that? Hear what? Matteo spoke with his mouth full. It's just the wind. That's not the wind. It was too sharp and too sweet to be the wind. It's music. It's a cello. Hear the low notes? Sophie dropped her food on the slate. She strained her ears. 
a tune came to her over the rooftops. She said, Is Foray's Requiem played double time? Sophie leapt up, spilling sausages into the fire. It's coming from over there. She tore to the far edge of the rooftop and stood on the tips of her toes, on the very edge of the roof, straining to hear. My mother, she thought, I am hearing my mother. The thought shook her to her bones. Can you hear it? She held her breath to listen. The music had stopped. God, Matteo, please say you hear it. Matteo stood and wiped his mouth. I heard it. How far away do you think it was? Can we go now? Come on, we'll go right now. Which way's fastest? I don't know. What? Yes, you do. You said you knew the whole of Paris. We need to go now. No. What are you? Look, quick. Come on, come on. We can't just run. Yes, we can. Stop, Sophie, listen. It stopped anyway. He was white. It could be miles away. You can't be sure where it came from. Didn't you know? The sound twists on rooftops. It echoes. It bluffs. But I could tell it was coming from there, Sophie pointed across the city. There, the Gare du Nord, the train station. Matteo didn't look at her. I know, he said. Then why did you just say you didn't? Let's go. I don't go to the station. You can go if you like. I can't. Yes, you can. I need you. You have to. I can't. The rooftops there belong to someone else. To who? He shook his head. I can't explain. Well, in that case, can we go? Her heart was booming in her ears. She had heard her mother play. We can go, but not tonight. If you want to go to the station, we'll need the others. The others? This was annoyingly cryptic. Sophie said, who? The other who? Matteo sighed. The other rooftoppers. But you said there weren't any others. I know. I lied. Then he turned to her. His gaze was the sort that sees your soul and made, makes you wonder where to put your hands. You said you could swim, didn't you? He said.